Girl Conference on Innovation to Tackle Global Sustainability Challenge. And welcome to our second keynote speech, Policy Implications for Corporate Social Sustainability Practices. Um, I, I couldn't really think of a scholar that can better fit our topic today other than Professor Siriana London. So it's, it's my great honor uh, to introduce her. She's such a wonderful scholar and role model to me as well. Um, I know that she's super busy. She actually uh, has to cancel two board meetings uh, in order to spend the time with us today. So thank you so much. Welcome, Siriana. Um, I'm sure there's no introduction needed to for Siriana. I'm just going to highlight a few achievements um, of her, and there are so many to mention. Uh, we all know that Siriana has uh, a co-author book, A Multinational Enterprise and the Global Economy, uh, a seminal book in the field of IB, right? I think everybody read the book. And uh, Siriana is the inaugural editor-in-chief of the Journal of International Business Policy, JIP, um, a top IB journal focusing on theoretical and empirical research in all area of policy. And in addition to her academic appointment, uh, Professor London has also served as a senior uh, economic affairs officer and a scholar in residence at the Division on Investment and Enterprise of the UN Conference on Trade and Development. Um, and she was also a associate research fellow of the Research Institute of the Finnish Economy, right? And of course, she's uh, AIB fellow, in fact, she is uh, a lifetime fellow of um, European uh, Academy of International Business, EBA. Um, she's a board member of many journals, um, the top journals, you can name it in international business. Uh, I just um, want to thank you, uh, Professor uh, London, for joining us and share her thoughts on policy implications for corporate social sustainability practices. So the floor is yours, Siriana. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, the very kind, very kind introductory words. So I will begin right away by uh, sharing my screen. I will aim to be sort of done in, in 40 minutes um, and then we can uh, discuss some of these issues. So let me just click for a second. And now, hopefully, if I get a thumbs up that you are looking at yep. presentation okay. screen, excellent. So I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation, Stephanie. Um, I'm happy particularly to be here because I've seen that many of my, my colleagues that I've known for years and, and who know a lot about sustainability have already been speaking. But there's one topic, uh, namely that connected to policy, that I think I can um, add a contribution in this context. Now. I give you a little bit of background um, on how I've uh, come to be uh, sort of connected to sustainability issues, because this actually goes back to the early 90s. Uh, that's when I was working on my own dissertation, uh, and that dealt with environmental issues in the pulp and paper industry. And this was uh, already then not purely from uh, a company point of view, because I was really interested in the relationship between public and private regulation. Uh, so by private regulation, I mean any kind of standard setting uh, by firms where they try to forestall uh, regulation or where they try to shape regulation, where the companies are suggesting alternatives um, for public regulation. Um, in the paper industry, this was, for instance, about the use of uh, recycled material um, instead of virgin pulp, and some companies argued for, some companies argued against. Um, and then there was the whole issue about chlorine um, in the paper making process, which was very much driven by uh, a totally different dynamic, which was the direct influence of NGOs and through NGOs, particularly Greenpeace, uh, the role of consumers. So what that taught me was that there are these interesting relationships between government regulation, between firms own initiatives, um, and what the market is demanding. Uh, in the case of the paper industry, and I think this is true in many other cases, the most blunt of these instruments is the link between the consumer and the firm. Um, in terms of what is shaping investment behavior, certainly in an industry like pulp and paper, very investment intensive, 
Um, it is not consumer action per se, but it is organized uh, consumer action, which is normally the voice of some kind of NGO. That is influential. The other thing that is influential is the relationship between uh, the regulators and the regulated. So how the firm uh, deals with government relationships and also how different these contexts can be. So without going into any more detail about that, what I was looking at was the difference between the context in Scandinavia, Finland and Sweden, Canada and the United States. And what that showed was that not only were the issues a little bit different depending on what market segments the, the firms were in, but really the regulatory context mattered. Uh, what kinds of relationships uh, were typical? Uh, typically in Scandinavia, the relationship was more conversational. Uh, it was uh, more communicative. Uh, it was one where there was a, a good deal of trust uh, between the government uh, and the firms. Uh, so that the firms were actually listened to quite comprehensively when it came to uh, redesigning and reshaping the environmental regulation. That was very different to the situation in the United States, where the relationship was more adversarial. There was a great deal of mistrust on, on both sides and, and a, a good deal of good skepticism um, about, well, firms shouldn't be dictating what is being done and, you know, uh, and so on. Now, I tell you this because that kind of basic um, set of issues has basically stayed with me ever since. I have worked on other issues in between, and I'm interested in a lot of different areas of policy where multinationals come into contact uh, with government. But it all kind of goes back to uh, that early research, which happened to be on environmental issues, uh, and that kind of highlighted how some of these connections work. Now, moving onwards from there, you see that I added a, a subtitle uh, to the talk, uh, and that's because in the recent um, five years or so, I have been working together with my colleagues at Aalto University in Finland uh, on different aspects uh, related to the energy transition. And as you can tell already from the examples that I've given, I tend to like to work in a specific industry context. So I understand the issues better when I sort of focus in on one industry and preferably one set of issues. Now, of course, with um, sustainability, this is a both a hindrance and a help because sustainability covers social sustainability, it covers labor standards, it covers uh, uh, obviously environmental issues and all other types of issues. What I prefer to do and what I will do today is to take one slice out of that. Um, and by doing that, I think I can highlight a few issues that are of interest certainly to me at the moment and that I think might also be interesting uh, for some of you in the future uh, in terms of research areas. So this is leading to point number two, which is shared value creation. Now, you may remember that this is a, a well-known HBR article uh, by Porter and Kramer, uh, where they were suggesting that shared value creation, uh, this process whereby firms kind of include different stakeholder groups uh, in, uh, in the design of their, their products and services um, is the sort of new way forward. It's a nice piece. Of course, it has been criticized um, uh, later on because uh, you could say it wasn't really saying anything new. Uh, these things had already been articulated by, uh, by scholars in the sustainability area, uh, but it managed to, to create quite a bit of discussion. Now, uh, for various reasons, I, I came to look at that paper recently, uh, and I realized that actually what I think is wrong with it um, and what I'm starting to learn in my study on the energy transition, it's that the shared value creation paper still implicitly assumes that the value is created by firms. It is then shared, um, although this is not exactly how it's described in the paper, but it's then shared with the other participants um, who are part of this co-creation process. But it starts with the, with the private firm. And what I want to suggest today is that I think uh, there are interesting questions to explore, particularly in connection with the energy transition, where the value creation process itself needs to be fully shared between public and private. And that, I think, takes me to number three, which is that I think we need a whole new generation of public-private partnerships, which are almost nothing like the PPPs that we have seen before, which are kind of almost like contractual entities where 
The uncertainties are more or less con controllable. They are very long-term contracts and where we kind of know how these things are going to unfold. And the investors have certain expectations about what kind of a project is going to be uh, fundable and what kind is not. So my agenda for today is to sort of argue why I think that the energy transition leads to this and then what are the implications of this new generation of public-private partnerships. Um, I have quite a few pictures, so uh, fear not that I'm going to be um, telling a long story with these slides, but just to, so that we are on the same page. So the context of the energy transition and where I got um, interested was that our first project at Aalto dealt with um, uh, electricity production, so electric utilities. And this is basically because, you know, you want to start where there's the greatest impact, or I want to start where the, where's the greatest impact. So let me work on a sector that is a major contributor uh, in terms of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So electricity is about a quarter, agriculture is another quarter, um, and then transportation, or, or rather industry and transportation. Now, another thing that is worth knowing um, and, and good to keep in mind is that here are here is a prediction, a fairly standard prediction about how our energy uh, use is going to change. Uh, so on the left side, we have what is the situation today. Uh, so still quite a large part dominated by uh, fossil based fuels. So that's the gray uh, brownish area. And then in the scenario prediction for 2050, you see that electricity would be already a half. Uh, of all the energy that is consumed. So it's saying that there's going to be a massive transformation uh, and it's going to involve electrification. And behind that is of course, uh, all these things that you have discussed um, from various points of view at this conference. Um, there's the Paris Climate Agreement specifically uh, concerning climate change. There is the European Union Green Deal that is uh, of great interest to us because I'm doing this work in Finland and Germany, so we are affected by the, the European Union Green Deal. Uh, and then, of course, there are the, the SDGs. Now, the European Green Deal uh, specifically um, predates uh, the pandemic, but as you know, that the, the post-pandemic uh, sort of recovery financing contains a large amount of money, uh, quite a big chunk of which has been allocated towards the European Green Deal. Uh, I believe the share is something like 37%, but I'm, it sounds very precise. I'm fairly sure that's correct, but it's something in that order. So a big part, this was pre-existing, uh, existed before the pandemic, uh, but now post-pandemic, it's getting even more of a push. So the European Union is pushing on all different fronts, um, including uh, on the side of green financing and this so-called taxonomy, which is a system of, of saying which activities really are green or not, all with an eye towards how do we spend a large amount of public money so that we encourage a large amount of private investment uh, in this area. So this is the context in which uh, we are doing our work. Um, the first project that I was involved with, the paper is actually out. Um, uh, it, was, it came out recently um, in JIBS. Um, it's still online, so it hasn't been put into an issue yet. Uh, it's part of a special issue on the, on the energy transition, but you can find it online. Now, this study on the electric utilities focused specifically on foreign investment in this area and basically asking the question, you know, how important are multinationals in this sector? Is foreign investment uh, an important issue when it comes to electric, electric utilities and their transformation towards um, non-fossil uh, sources. If we just look at numbers again, uh, you can see that this is uh, different areas of different areas that dominated foreign investment in 2020. And you can see that actually solar and wind are one of the most uh, dynamic areas based on FDI markets uh, data in this, uh, in this time period. It's been too, true for a couple of years. So if your first suspicion was, well, electric utilities, I mean, they, these are not really the, the foreign investors that everybody thinks about. Um, let me assure you that this is a real phenomenon. It, it is happening. Um, and it's interesting to look at what kinds of companies um, are active there. Now, I don't want to go into the details of the paper. You can look at it uh, if you're interested. 
Uh, we used um, uh, a, a method that, that results in a, in a bubble graph uh, like this. So, so we analyzed this, um, uh, now I forgot the, the name of the method. Um, what is this called? Comparative. Okay. Bassett analysis. Go. Yes, exactly. Thank you. I can't remember my own methodology. <laughs> but, uh, so this the name is, is tricky because it's fuzzy set. It's fuzzy. Yes, it is, it is fuzzy set. So here are five paths that lead to FDI and renewables. Here are four paths that lead to the opposite. In other words, non-renewable investment. And we looked at it uh, because we come from IB as what kind of FSAs uh, are there? What kind of CSAs are present? What combinations of FSAs and CSAs result in green or non-green investment? And what we did in the end was without going into any details, we put them into a, a sort of a two by two like this. And we said high and low country specific advantages, high and low firm specific. What you need to know is that the Colorless boxes are the good boxes. This is the renewable investment. And you can see that firm specific advantages are largely driving the renewable investment. This is accumulated over time. And this is a real impact on greening the industry. This is net, uh, net of any uh, non-renewable investment that these firms are making. And this was uh, a very interesting exercise because we first first of all learned um, that also in this area uh, that is dominated by quite a few state-owned firms or formerly state-owned firms, um, we find investors that are both private and state-owned. The, the big advances in greening are done by private firms, uh, but the state ownership is certainly uh, a factor there as well. Now, from there, because we were interested in, in electricity, you remember that it's supposed to be a half of all the energy that's consumed by 2050. So it makes sense to look at the electric utilities and say, is FDI, is the cross-border investment by these utilities a catalyst? A catalyst that would allow for this transformation to, to happen sooner. And what this paper does is it says, yes, and these are the kinds of companies and actually talks about them by name uh, because this is case-based um, who are driving this transformation. Now that leads me to a second uh, project which is a bigger project um, where I'm involved in one part, the third part uh, where we look at the energy transition risks in shipping and aviation. Now, if you remember the, the first diagram that I showed um, Transportation emissions are about 14% um, of the total. So uh, the electricity generation was 24 or 25. This is 14%. So this is, what, again, what, picking one of the big areas uh, that needs to transform itself. Now, at the moment, um, I'm working on the third part. The first two parts are more firm internal. So they talk about how firms communicate um, about these uh, energy transitions how they deal with them internally within the organization. And then my part, which is looking at the co-innovation processes, not only with industry participants, uh, but together with the public sector. And that's where, where I come in. And we are looking at um, mainly at airlines, but, but also a little bit at shipping. Now that 14% of the total pie uh, is then divided in the following way. The big blue area is road transport, but that's fairly easy in that we think ele electric cars are going to uh, be a big part of this um, equation. Rail is quite small. Uh, then you see uh, international aviation is this orange slice. Domestic aviation is the, the dark green and international and coastal shipping uh, is the lighter green. So these are non-negligible -neg areas. Of course, what the airlines uh, sometimes like to say is they say, oh, we're only a few percent uh, of the total emissions. Why do you even concern yourself with airlines? Uh, but that's, of course, a little bit of a fallacy because um, the emissions from airlines, uh, if we don't do anything about them, then this will remain, has to remain basically an elite activity where a small number of travelers is responsible for a great uh, amount of those emissions and that everyone else basically needs to be told that for the sake of the planet, you know, you mustn't travel. So that doesn't seem to be a working future. Uh, and therefore, of course, companies also in this industry, different orientations are thinking about 
uh, how to um, come up with different ways of, of basically fueling transport so that it's sustainable. That then leads to another area which is beginning to be very interesting, which is that, well, if it's not electricity, uh, which we think mostly in aviation it's not going to be, uh, it's not like road transport, uh, then it leads to these so-called difficult to electrify areas. These are all industries that are responsible for quite a bit uh, of the emissions. Uh, iron and steel, uh, for example, aviation shipping, uh, heavy road transport. And the one common denominator here uh, is that one solution that might be at least a partial solution for all of them is the use of hydrogen. Uh, the use of hydrogen, uh, which through ele ele electrolysis uh, can be uh, created by use of renewable energy. The process exists already. Uh, it's just that it's mostly not done with renewable energy, but it is possible to do it uh, with renewable energy. Uh, once you have the hydrogen, you can then combine it. Uh, you can combine it to produce uh, green ammonia. You can combine it to produce synthetic fuels, or you can use the hydrogen on its own, but it, then it needs to be compressed uh, as gas or as liquid, and then you can use it directly for fuel or indirectly as shown here. Now, why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because in the course of this project, um, I've come across a couple of um, sort of... Uh, discoveries that have made me really sort of rethink the relationship between firms and governments in this particular segment. The first one uh, is an energy island. Uh, now, uh, the energy island will be reality. So this is a project uh, that the Danish government has committed itself to. Uh, it will be the first of its kind. Um, and it will be a public-private uh, Partnership. So the ownership will be, if I remember correctly, 51% uh, with the Danish state and uh, other private companies can take part. Not only that, but it will be providing electricity to a number of different countries, uh, to the Netherlands, to Denmark, to Germany, uh, uh, may have been one more uh, in there. So multiple countries will get electricity from here. And as you can see, in the, it's not a real picture, it's obviously a computer picture. Uh, but you can see that there's a huge sea of uh, wind turbines uh, in the sea, uh, which will create the green electricity. And then here, synthetic fuels uh, can be produced uh, or the electricity can, can be transmitted uh, directly. In other words, it can be stored, often using some sort of a hydrogen form, or it can be transmitted directly. And then I discovered this. I discovered something else. So this thing looks like it's something from Star Wars. But again, this is an energy distribution concept, uh, which is um, made mostly privately uh, by a bunch of Norwegian uh, and Finnish firms uh, whose idea is to create these energy islands for the refueling of ocean going ships. And the idea would be to sort of replicate this model uh, again, uh, using green hydrogen uh, as the basic source of fuel and then uh, distributing the energy in that way. Now, I tell you, I show you these examples to say, this is very different from the discussion that I witnessed you know, in the early 1990s. In the early 1990s, the solutions uh, to the environmental problems were known to the firms. They were no, it was not this kind of a massive shift where you reimagine completely how the, how the industry is working. It was rather, well, we could do this, we could do A or we could do B. Uh, which one would be better for us? Which one can we sell uh, to the regulators? And then we negotiate about it, which one would be a reasonable option. This is a totally different process. Um, and because of that, uh, I think the energy transition poses risks that are sort of qualitatively different uh, from the risks that we are used to talking about. Uh, when it comes to these sustainability activities. First of all, they are systemic. They are systemic involving not only partners in the value chain, but involving national governments, supranational entities like the European Union. Uh, so for instance, the European Union is now seriously considering some kind of border adjustment taxes uh, in order to protect companies uh, that are investing in green uh, production methodologies. This was something that as I was writing my, my dissertation, I came across, the idea existed in the early 90s. No one in the world took it seriously. This was thought to be 
you cannot do that. This is just provoking a trade war. Basically, these are tools that no one can use and, and no one should touch. And now we live in different times. Um, and this is all on the table. The other thing is that there are multiple systems that might run in parallel because it's not at all clear. So I've given you these kind of hydrogen driven examples, but it's not at all clear whether that will always be uh, the dominant solution. However, once uh, a public entity like a government makes a decision uh, to be a co-partner in one of these technologies, it's not as if you can run very many multiple trials with these technologies. It's not a real options approach in that sense, because you are committed then to an infrastructure. And although the parallel technologies exist, you can't easily run them at the same time. So this existence of multiple systems, I think makes this again, a more complex situation than we have had before. Then we have to it the temporal dimension. So in the 1990s, when we were talking about chlorine and we were talking about recycled fibers, there was no temporal dimension. It was uh, leading firms were the ones who were the first ones taking the steps. If you were not a leader, you were a laggard, you could just lag you know, quite comfortably for a while. That's not the case now because the European Union is committed uh, to, to its 2050 goals. Finland has actually declared a very ambitious goal of carbon neutrality by 2035. Uh, so if that were to be uh, met, this really means investments that are starting to roll uh, in the next five years or so. So we face an investment situation where you have this sort of externally imposed, um, I mean, basically somehow with all of our consents, but externally imposed timeline, which within which you have to reach these um, investment decisions. And I think all of this boils down to a huge challenge, not only for the firms, not only for the MEs, but for governments. Um, it requires new capabilities because this is not just about convincing the regulator that your chosen alternative A is better than B. This is really about co-creating a future that requires a lot of public investment, which now has additional boost from the recovery funds from the European Union. Um, but it is tremendous risk taking by governments, by firms, and doing it jointly if this kind of movement is, is going to be realized. So the net zero challenge, uh, my final slide, is that I think we need an entrepreneurial state co coupled with entrepreneurial firms in order to actually reach these massive goals. The challenge is awesome. Uh, the possibilities, I think, are uh, almost equally awesome. Uh, the more I read about it, the more uh, I think this, this is actually a very exciting time uh, for a lot of the firms. Um, but I think we are really in the beginning of studying and trying to understand, let alone uh, providing uh, good advice on how firms should go about developing these skills. And then we still need to talk about the public sector. The public sector is not geared up as it at the moment for being an entrepreneurial state. And here I'm very much on the same lines with uh, Mariana Matsupato, who has written a couple of, of recent books on this topic. Um, it's clear we know that public investment in R&D is behind a lot of R&D performance of private firms that, that we've already known. Uh, but really going into a bit more detail about how the state has kind of faded into the background because we favored markets and we favored uh, market-driven regulation. But that has a cost, which is that the, the civil service, the people who are there to uh, craft regulation, enforce regulation, act as partners on the other side, have not really been prepared to be entrepreneurial, let alone some sort of venture capitalists um, in their own economy. So I think we need new thinking about how to train the next generation of, of civil servants, just as well as we need to train the next generation of corporate executives, particularly in these sectors that are so directly uh, at the center of the transformation um, concerning the energy transition. That is it. That is my, my burning speech. So I will stop um, my screen sharing. Um, 
Stephanie asked me a couple of questions uh, in the beginning, said, yeah, you don't have to do this, but um, so why is it important to study uh, the policy connection? I, I hope that I have made the case here uh, that I think it's vital and that these are certainly areas of the economy where I think firms can't do it alone, uh, but it requires more of governments as well. I think it's extremely exciting to study this. Um, and I would only sort of pick up on a couple of things in the in the previous session. Uh, I think Brian mentioned uh, North, uh, the, the later version of North. So not, not the North of 1990, but the North of 2005 um, and onwards. And I would just really echo that. Um, I'm also at, at the beginning of thinking, how do we really conceptualize this? Uh, how do we frame it appropriately? But I think the North's ideas about the sort of psychological basis of all change and, and institutional change then sort of at, at the very aggregate level, I think those are ideas that, that could really well deserve to be looked at um, again, and not only the, the, the 1990 North. Um, and then I think we have a lot that we can actually use from the uh, firm level uh, literature on entrepreneurial um, uh, firms. So not only uh, entrepreneurial firms in the classical sense, so in the innovation sense, uh, but also in the sense of uh, institutionally uh, entrepreneurial firms. And I think there, there's quite a rich literature there and that, that we can uh, use and apply in this context, but understanding the different context of, of the um, uh, public servants and, and regulation, and on the other hand, of private firms. So I see a tremendous um, amount of work that, that should be done. Um, uh, and I can only hope that, that others will come along on this uh, journey with us, uh, with their research. Good. Thank you so much, Seriana, for showcasing how to conduct scholarly work with heavy uh, policy implications. So as editor-in-chief in JIP, what common mistake do you see people, particularly junior scholars, in conducting research you know, with heavy policy implications? What advice would you give to people? I think I, I also really like what Alvaro said um, in that, you know, we can't or we shouldn't, I think, pick topics and say, oh, do this, do, do that. Um, but pick something that's genuinely important, you know, and this is not to sort of, this is not to put down any particular line of, of research, but if you're interested at all in issues of public policy, then why not go big? Why not really look for the issues that that have in my own work as i said i kind of took a proxy and i said let me work on those sectors where the impact is the largest it also turns out that those are mostly capital heavy sectors where there's a limited number of firms it makes life easier because you can get kind of a comprehensive overview of the industry um, with relatively few firms um, that has a certain virtue to it. Now, that's not a universal solution. It obviously doesn't work for, for every question. Uh, but it worked for me in the sense that I thought it was meaningful uh, that when I got some results, I kind of knew that that's, that's how this sector works. That's how investment in that sector works. This, this is, these are the two paths or these are the three paths uh, that are feasible. And then trying to understand why would one choose one uh, rather than the other. And, then in the long run, what the what the consequences are. So I, I would echo them and say, you know, pick something, pick something important and meaningful, and then you do have to sell it. Um, you do have to convince people. It's easier today. I think you you don't have really people anymore who would say, oh, this is you know why why are you doing? <laughs> and but I think there is a little bit of a danger, and I think it was maybe Alvaro who was alluding to it, which is that just because it's something to do with sustainability doesn't make it interesting. Um, so, or, or let's put it this way, doesn't make it interesting for me. So I have followed the literature for quite a while now, um, but just because it's about sustainability and just because very rightly, and it's fantastic that people are getting interested, but of course there, there is a kind of a superficial layer to it, which is not enough. Uh, I mean, if you're considering that you're a young scholar and this will be not your life's work, you will do other things, but that this will shape your thinking conceivably for the years to come, then why would you sell yourself short and, and start with a question that maybe even you don't fully believe in or understand why that is important? Um, 
I think I can't sell anything that I don't find important myself. So for me, that would be important that I can convince myself that it's worth my while. And then I will try to sell that to others. I thank you. I really like um, how you talk about there's new public private collaboration. So there's a lot of opportunities. Um, it has evolved a lot in terms in terms of content and the scale, the magnitude of the collaboration. So uh, I wonder if you what's your view about across countries, public private collaboration. So uh, some of the examples you touch upon already involves multiple countries in Europe, right? Yeah. So what about in a greater uh, scale of cross-country collaboration among the globe? Um, yeah. What are your thoughts? I think that's a great question. That's a great question. In the energy context, I think it will naturally be the case that these are regional rather than global uh, because it's just a question of distribution. So um, it's quite... And to turn the question around, um, in fact, it's not a coincidence that since we do this work uh, in Finland, which has a very aggressive uh, climate goal, none of these initiatives, uh, well, the island is Danish, but none of these initiatives are single country initiatives because it would make no sense for one country alone to, to do this. So these are in fact, Nordic cooperation. There is clearly um, preparedness to, to work on this on a regional level. In energy, this makes every bit of sense because you do have to create a bigger energy market um, for various reasons. Overall, um, and another question that, that sort of interests me, but that, that I have no particular answers for is how will this work for emerging markets? Uh, how will this work? So they face an interesting situation because of course in the developed world, you know, we are at the point where we are starting to uh, decouple growth from emissions. In other words, we're not growing very much, but we are also managing to, you know, uh, pull down our emissions, hopefully, mostly. In emerging markets, it's a different situation. Uh, so what, what that means uh, for energy companies is that this is not a big growth market. You know, yes, the industry will change and the, the basis of the energy will change, but this is not a growth market. When you look at where people will need more energy, that's obviously in the emerging uh, markets. Uh, that's where the demand is going to be. So if I think in the context of the FDI and renewables, these are interesting markets. Um, they are not markets that have necessarily managed to decouple yet. Um, and China is an interesting single case, which I've only followed from aside. So we, we had no data on Chinese firms uh, because it's huge investment in renewables and huge investment in coal. <laughs> so uh, you have both uh, going on at the same time uh, to, to meet the energy demand. Um, I'm not sure that answered your question. Yes, I, th I think okay. it definitely answers the question. Yeah, coming okay. from China, I can definitely relate to many of the points you pointed out. Uh, I saw a question in the chat from Zhang. Um, speaking of collaboration among countries, he talked about the how the UK government prepared independent report and um, also the assessment in terms of we are, in terms of sustainability, um, resilient inclusive recovery um, is not very hopeful. So I guess, um, again, different country, um, although um, energy and many of the grand challenge is actually a shared global agenda, but in practice, right, we do have different country, uh, regional, even community, different levels of policies. I guess, do you have any respond to John's comment in terms of- It's a yeah. wonderful comment. I don't know the document. I have to actually go and look it up because that, that I, I just wasn't aware of it. Um, so the G7 obviously is not the most, um, it's not the best forum for, you know, sort of earth moving action. So things tend to be sort of sorted out well, well in advance and, and then you have a bland communique. Um, I think the European Union case is interesting um, because they really, they were on this path already. And now with the, the whole recovery program, this is becoming one of the cornerstones in addition to, to health and digital um, that are going to be pushed forward. And I think the, the idea there is that they are hoping obviously for a, a relationship of something like one to seven or one to eight or one to nine of public money to private money in order to catalyze the investment. Um, 
I am still hopeful because I kind of believe in the power of demonstration. Uh, so that's why I'm interested in these Nordic projects. Um, because on one level, you know, I, I come from Finland and so I have a lot of sympathy for these little Nordic countries, but on one level you think, well, whatever happens there, who cares? They are so small and, you know, teeny tiny. Uh, I think the demonstration effect can be quite substantial if we can get these projects off the ground um, and working. And then there, there comes the second point, which is that in the FDI project on um, the utilities, what was the case was that the companies that had had the previous experience of accumulating experience uh, of these types of investments were, were then over time becoming even more active as foreign investors. So I think this experience that is accumulated and obviously some, some kind of trial and error as well will allow for some degree of scalability in other parts of the world. So I am hopeful for that. I'm also hopeful for emerging markets in the sense that there is so much potential there that if we can undertake enough of these projects in the developed world so that the economics um, of it are kind of proven, then I don't see why this would not, not form attractive investment projects um, also in emerging markets. In a sense, allowing them to bypass uh, certain steps of the of the dirty uh, energy production stages, um, but you know at the same time, I am aware of people who who know much more of about history than than I do, who say all of these things can reverse. Um, I think we are at a good point right now. Uh, there is a bit of a momentum, obviously, from. Um, the terrible pandemic, but the post-pandemic recovery, there is real money. Uh, so if we actually get these multipliers of private investment, this would make a difference, at least in this demonstration project sense. Um, I am hopeful about that, but I am also aware uh, that these are only human agreements and, and th this can reverse. We, we get some strange adverse event and, and these things can change. Great. We have another question. Uh, although it's about UK, the example is about UK, how UK government has decided uh, to kind of like introduce state-owned models for the railway franchising, uh, railway industry. So mm -hmm. what is your opinion about the reform in the context of private-public relationship? I think not just UK, we see globally the emergence of new state capitalism, I think overall. That's exactly why we have this panel talking about the policy implications so, Sarah, yeah. Do yeah, you said it, Stephanie, state capitalism, a new form of state capitalism. I think this is nothing short of a new form of, of capitalism. I think state capitalism maybe in some years makes it sound a little bit scary. Um, it is factually what it is. It is the re-entrance of the state uh, into different parts of the economy. And I think there are lots of discussions to be had. So, you know, let, let's not, I mean, I'm not naive enough to believe that we can all of a sudden go to, oh, government knows how to do everything and let them just, you know, <laughs> no, we don't have to go from one extreme to the other. We also need to build the capacity of, of the entrepreneurial state, which we have not really engaged uh, in the last few years. So I would not be surprised if they were not fantastic um, coming off the gates uh, in, in these sorts of projects. So I do see a greater in involvement. I hope that we can, uh, and this is really a very multi-level collaboration, discussions of by academics in forums like this, uh, what we do in our consultancy, what we do in, in other bits of work, to really talk about the interfaces, the human interfaces uh, that connect firms and governments, uh, that create um, enough trust so that long-term investment plans can be jointly agreed. Um, I think trust must play um, an important role there. Uh, and of course, we have quite a bit of research about not only sort of national level metrics of trust, um, but how you engender trust in relationships. I mean, we've done a lot of work on different kinds of partnering. I, I think we need to just transfer that to a different context. Um, where we really need to look at governments as partners, as co-creators. So like I said at the beginning, it's not shared value that's created by the private sector and then shared in some way. It is, the, 
the process of jointly um, engaging in these rather massive um, investments. Okay, thank you. One final question. Um, SDGs are hot, right? People are, have a lot of heated discussion in terms of SDGs. I also see uh, many of your work mentioned about SDG as well. So, um, and particularly during pandemic, I think many people recognize the important role of international NGOs, transnational NGOs, right? So I guess, what are your views in terms of uh, suggestions for people who are interested in studying cross-sector collaborations with NGOs? What are the roles of uh, NGO, transnational NGOs? Um, and any thoughts, any suggestions along this line? Yeah, yeah well, fantastically important. Uh, it, it's even, you know, one of the modalities or whatever they call it, partnering is, is one of the main mechanisms whereby uh, the SDGs are going to be reached. So I think this is another case of, um, I mean, in your last session, you talked about the sort of skill set that is needed uh, for these partnerships. Now, clearly some firms have, have already managed and they've built a skill set. Um, I could imagine that there's a long tail of firms that haven't, uh, haven't even tried and, and you know, do not have the skill set uh, to engage in these. I think that's very clear. Um, I, I have a, a sort of a passing knowledge of some of the issues to do with uh, human rights issues. And those are very typically, I mean, Brian talked about um, disadvantaged people and the, the, the non-elites, uh, indigenous people and so on. I think those are classically the cases where no multinational would have uh, sufficient information, understanding, where they really would need to rely on these partners. But that is interestingly, and I think we can learn a lot from that context as well, it is again the kind of partnering where you have to trust and you have to rely on the other partner to convey to you some of the essential uh, information that you need for decision making. I think these are very challenging human relationships and, and they require skill sets. Um, that we need to cultivate. And obviously this sets an agenda for, for business schools and universities in general um, about how we are training people and, and what we are really emphasizing as being um, key, key qualities. Um, uh, Jonathan reminded us in the chat that it's actually in SDG Goal 17, Partnership exactly. for the Goal. Yes, yes, exactly. That's exactly what I was referring to. That, right, right, that, right. that it is actually in there, that, that it's partnership is one of the um, it's one of the main mechanisms, yeah. Right. We have one final important task. So we're going to take a group picture, virtual group picture. Oh, <laughs> so uh, everybody, please turn on your camera and uh, we give you a few minutes and then we can, that's an uh, exciting time. So uh, again, um, stay tuned. Hopefully next year we can have our um, in-person conference, maybe in DC or Atlanta or Bloomington, Indiana. That, that sounds very good. I really enjoyed the previous session yesterday. Unfortunately, I was not able to be there, but today really enjoyed the previous session. Oh, thank you. So again, we will uh, share the recorded uh, uh, video with everyone uh, registered for the conference. Okay. Great. Uh, okay, so um, Ryan, are you ready to do the screenshot? I can do a couple as well, so. All right, so we are going to do a feel, okay. Okay, one, two, three. Okay. All right, I'm gonna do the second page. I think we're fine, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. All right. Um, thank you so much, Sariana. Uh, we really enjoyed the talk. Um, and uh, everybody have a great summer. And oh, we have one more session, uh, the practitioner session. Um, yeah. So we put everybody in the waiting room again, and we will let everybody back in in about 15 minutes. Yeah. Thank Very you. Yeah. Thank you.